Okay. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our international ground round. I'm very pleased today to have another guest. Uh, today, uh, it's turn for my colleague, Professor Thibaut Van Ziel from Ghent University. Good afternoon, Thibaut. Good afternoon, Puja. Thank you for having me. So, you. let me switch a little bit and close your presentation so we can close the presentation so I can introduce uh, the topic for today. So the topic, today's topic is focused on surgery for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. So as you might be aware, what we do have now are an increased possibility of combining medical therapy, not only drug therapy, but also monoclonal antibodies, but of course, the aim and the need for surgery are still needed. And today's topic from Thibault will be focused exactly on what are the methodologies and what do we have to address the perfect therapy, which could be surgery in this case uh, for chronic rhinosinusitis. Please, as usual, do remind that you can ask, you can type your question, and we will go through all these questions at the end of Thibault's presentation. Please, Thibaut, share your presentation and we will go further with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Puja, for the introduction. So I have to share it again. Exactly. Maybe it should be this one. Is it okay? Perfect. Okay. So thank you again for, for inviting me to, uh, to your organization to give this talk. Um, I will um, focus especially on um, surgery for chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps, not really on um, how you should uh, technically do your, your surgery uh, and do your revision surgery, but more about um, the broad concepts um, of how we should uh, surgically treat uh, patients with nasal polyps. And of course, this is not um, my own work. It's it's the work of a lot of people uh, from our group. Uh, so we have uh, an upper areas research, research laboratory. We had a lot of fellows visiting us the last years. And also, of course, of my, my mentor, uh, Professor Klaus Bachert. So a, a little bit on the state of the art, um, what is known, and this is a publication from Klaus Bachert um, in uh, Nature, um, where yeah we, we give a broad summary about, okay, what are the complaints of nasal polyps versus chronic sinusitis without nasal polyps? So as you know, we, we speak now about chronic sinusitis with or without nasal polyps, and then we will further differentiate into which is called a non-type 2 or a type 2 disease which I will uh, discuss with you later on. So what, what we know is that, of course, when you don't have polyps, but you have, a, a, let's say, edema and mucus in the middle meatus, we speak about chronic sinusitis without nasal polyps. When we see polyps in the middle meatus or in the superior meatus, we speak about chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps. There is some uh, a lot of evidence that the symptoms are different between those two diseases. So we have more loss of smell in polypoid disease, while we have more facial pressure in chronic sinusitis without nasal polyps. Important to know um, is that um, there is a big difference in asthma comorbidity between the two groups. Eh? We have, um, let's say, an average of 20% of the patients without polyps who will have a concomitant asthma. Um, and this is much higher in the group which has, has, which has nasal polyps. Eh? It's up to, to 70%, especially in the severe disease. Um, and of course, the recurrence within, um, let's say, long term after surgery is also largely different. And I will uh, give more details about that later. So um, I think we discussed a little bit of the phenotypes. Eh? So having polyps, having no polyps. Um, but of course, you can go deeper and then we go looking into endotypes. And um, for us, it's, it's very important also when you consider surgery to look into, into endotypes because an endotype 
will also predict um, the success of your surgery, so uh, the outcome of your surgery. So what we did in the past, and this is a publication from 2016 from Peter Thomason, uh, where we looked at um, samples from chronic sinusitis patients without or with polyps, and we just uh, measured them from for a lot of cytokines, um, and also IgE and ECP and MPO. And we then let statistic a program decide which were the clusters. And then we clearly saw that we had um, two clusters, which one was a cluster which was IL-5 negative and a cluster which was IL-5 positive. And if you then look at the prevalence of polyps and also the prevalence at asthma, you really see that although it's a disease continuum, you see that chronic sinusitis without nasal polyps are mainly IL-5 negative, have um, interferon gamma, have IL-17, and also a neutrophilic inflammation. While the more you go into the group, which has a higher prevalence of nasal polyps, you see more IgE coming, more IL-5 coming. Um, there is still some IL-17 and interferon gamma, but you really see this big red cluster here of high levels of IgE, IL-5, and ECP. And then, of course, you have the highest group, with very high levels of IL-5, IgE, and ECP. And these are really the patients who have uh, severe polyposis, who have severe late onset eosinophilic asthma. And these are, of course, the patients that we have some troubles uh, treating surgically. So what we should know is that we now have, in fact, three types of inflammatory signatures. Uh, we have type 1, uh, which is T helper 1 and LC1. With interferon gamma, you have type 2. Uh, with T helper 2 and LC2 cells with IL-5, IL-10, IL-13. And then we have also type 3, which is more the T helper 17 uh, group. And why, why it's important, you will see later on, if you really look and focus on this type 2 disease, you should really treat them in a different way than a non-type 2 disease, which could be type 1 and type 3. So this is a, a graphical overview of, of the pathophysiology, how we think now um, a type 2 disease um, is, 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 let's say, the pathophysiology behind that. So probably you will have some um, epithelial damage and also some irritants. This could be allergen, viruses, uh, irritants. You get a stimulation of ILC2 cells and T helper 2 cells, which will then lead to a production of IL-4 and B cells that will go into production of IgE and also production of IL-4, which then leads to an eosinophilic inflammation. And so what we have to really remember is that we have an eosinophilic inflammation, we have high levels of IgE, and we have an activated ILC2 cells and T helper 2 cells. So that's what you should remember of, of the endotyping. And when you're in clinic, of course, you don't have uh, the possibility to measure a lot of, um, let's say, cytokines and IgE in the tissue, but there are some real easy clinical factors, endotypes and phenotypes that can help you with this. Eh? So if you have a patient um, which has polyps and is, he also has a blood eosinophilia count higher than 300 per microliter, he has a high IgE, he has also um, asthma, then it's the chance is very, very high that you will have a type 2 disease. Eh? So by looking at eosinophils in the blood, IgE in the blood, and looking at asthma comorbidity, you were really uh, will be very successful in um, identifying type 2 disease. And why is this important? It's um, that when we were trained originally, and I think it's a, the, the, the uh, theory by Messerklinger and Stamberger is, is still actual and, and still good about functional endoscopic sinus surgery, that we should work around the ostia and to improve ventilation and, and drainage. But on the other hand, if we look at the disease, what we know about disease now, we know that a disease like nasal polyps, it's not about infection or it's not about obstruction. It's an inflammatory disease. And of course, it's another way of looking at this disease and another way of performing surgery when you're dealing with an obstruction, no problem, or when you're dealing with an inflammatory problem. So, and what we know is that uh, we, we do nice surgery, we can, we can remove polyps in the atmoid in the frontal uh, recess, um, and we hope, of course, that after five to ten years, we still will have this very nice patent aerated frontal sinus, but the reality is all is sometimes different, uh, where we see that after a few weeks already, uh, small polyps are coming uh, back. Now, 
there are some very nice studies like this one that really show that um, endoscopic sinus surgery in type 2 disease is, is an effective surgery. Uh, this was a nice publication um, from uh, the group of uh, Amsterdam from uh, um, Witzke Fokkens, uh, where they looked at uh, the efficacy of endoscopic sinus surgery with medical treatment versus medical treatment alone. And they clearly showed that uh, in this randomized trial, which was published in the, in the Lancet last year, that you have a significant difference in SNOT22. So you really can improve significantly the outcome of your poly patient uh, after a one year. And there are significant differences in nasal symptoms as well. And also you have less use of oral corticosteroids in this group. Now, of course, you can criticize this study because it's only for 12 months. And we know that uh, for nasal polyps, uh, we, we really have to look at the long term. Uh, so this was a study by Claire Hopkins, uh, where they looked at the effect of endoscopic sinus surgery in a very large British cohort. And this was published in, already in 2009 in the laryngoscope. And they could actually show that um, <clears throat> the effect of an endoscopic sinus surgery, they had a follow-up of five years that it also lasts five years. Huh? So the majority of the patients will still have a clear benefit of the endoscopic sinus surgery in terms of SNOT22 outcomes after five years. And you see that uh, patients um, with polyps are, are having an even more benefit than patients without polyps. Huh? Um, and also, if you look at the um, rate of revision surgery, then you, of course, see that there is a difference that polyp patients will have more revisions within five years, up to 20% compared to the non-polyp patients. And they have a recurrence of polyps. It's actually um, known that between two to four years, it's between 20 to 40% of the polyps that will recur. Now, the question, of course, is what will be the recurrence of polyps on long-term? And that's, of course, an important question. Uh, on short-term, we can show results about 40% of recurrence. And this is a study also from Belgium in which we also participated from uh, Stefan Vlaming, where they looked at 10 years. And so they looked really at patients who had an eosinophilic inflammation in their polyps. And we actually saw that the recurrence of polyps is about 62% after 10 years. And that especially the patients who have concomitant asthma, allergy, and also, of course, have eosinophils in the tissue, have eosinophilic rich mucin, that they have a much higher chance of having recurrence within those 10 years than patients who don't have this eosinophilic inflammation. Now, we also have one study from our own. It's a rather old study, but it was published in 2019. And I think this is one of the, the studies with the longest follow-up so far published, I think, with 12 years. Um, where we looked at the recurrence rate of nasal polyps. And then you actually could see that maybe we were bad surgeons. Right? We, you see that we have a nasal polyp recurrence in about 80% of the cases after 12 years. Huh? Of course, having a nasal polyp recurrence does not really mean that this patient is very symptomatic and that this patient will need to revision. Huh? You see that only 37% uh, will have a revision within uh, 12 years. But if you ask the patient uh, how he, he feels, uh, how he judges his improvement, you see that even after 12 years, uh, the majority of the patients, it's more than 80%, will have a moderate to complete relief of their symptoms. Uh, so having a recurrence does not really need say that patients will need revision surgery. And also, if you look at the size of the polyps that recur in this group, uh, so this is this 12-year follow-up uh, follow uh, group, you will see that in the beginning, uh, the majority of the patients will have a divorce 3 to 6, so the combination of both sides. Uh, and that if you look at uh, 6 years and you look at 12 years, you will see that um, still a lot of patients will have uh, very small polyps, and it's only a very tiny group of patients that will have a massive recurrence of nasal polyps. Now, we also looked uh, whether the endotype uh, can predict recurrence, and this is a, a study uh, from 2014, uh, where we looked at, again, the endotypic endotypes regarding inflammation 
in polyps and we divide it into two groups, patients who will have a recurrence, so in this 12-year follow-up, and patients who will not have a recurrence in this 12-year follow-up. And you actually see that even in the polyp group, uh, patients who have um, high levels of ECP, high levels of uh, IL-5, are in the majority will recur, while if the polyp patients are a non-type 2, uh, there is very little chance that the patient will uh, have a recurrence. So also the endotyping of the polyp will uh, predict the recurrence uh, of the polyps on long term. Now, of course, um, we, we cannot be satisfied or happy um, when we have recurrence rates between 60 to 80 percent and revision rates between 20 to 30 percent. So the, the, the question really is how can we improve our outcomes of endoscopic sinus surgery in a type 2 disease? Um, and I think we can pose ourselves two questions. So, so first, when to operate? Uh, so um, should we operate when there is very little disease or should we wait uh, when there is lots of pathology, when you have a grade four polyposis on both sides? And the other question um, that we can pose ourselves is how to operate a type two disease. Do we have to be conservative or do we have to be a little bit more aggressive or do more extensive surgery? And can we have a disease modifying effect um, with uh, uh, this kind of, of surgery? So the first question, um, when to operate, the timing of the surgery, um, I think has been partially answered by, by the group of, of Claire Hopkins. Um, this was on the left side, a publication uh, from 2015, where they looked at um, three cohorts of patients with um, chronic sinusitis with polyps. And they looked whether there was an early cohort, a mid cohort or late cohort. Um, and they actually saw that um, the percentage of, um, let's say, change in SNOT22 was the highest in the patients who had were in the early phase of the disease. And also this result maintained for five years, while patients who are in the mid or in the late cohort had, OK, they had an improvement in the SNOT22, but you see that the effect uh, uh, became smaller uh, after uh, the surgery. And in this study, this was a second study, uh, was uh, where they looked at the percentage of patients presenting with asthma. And if the surgery was done within the first two years, uh, there was a lower uh, risk of uh, developing asthma after the surgery compared to patients who were already a little bit further away in disease. So it means that treating your patients early in the disease process can not only improve the outcome, but it can also have a disease modifying effect with a lower risk of developing uh, late onset eosinophilic uh, asthma. And this was a little bit confirmed also by the study from Stefan Vlaming. Uh, if he looked um, at the patients uh, who he would treat it and he followed them for 13 uh, for 10 years, he saw that of in this group, if the patients didn't have asthma at the surgery, 70% will develop uh, during uh, the 10 years follow-up, will develop uh, eosinophilic asthma. And of course, this phenotype was again associated with a higher risk of recurrence. So probably by doing your surgery earlier in the disease, we can maybe change the course of the disease and also the comorbidities that uh, arise. So then we come back to, let's say, how can we improve outcomes uh, with, uh, let's say, the type of, of the surgery, how to operate a type 2 disease. And I think then we have to come back to what really is functional endoscopic sinus surgery and what is complete sinus surgery. Um, and in 2018, we, we had uh, the honor to have uh, a lot of uh, key opinion leaders in the field uh, in Ghent for a skull-based course. And at that time, at that moment, we took the time to also do a Delphi consensus panel on what really is uh, endoscopic sinus surgery. And we, we came by, let's say, a big agreement to these four principles. So first of all, you have to create a sinus cavity that incorporates the natural ostium. If you don't do that, I, you can consider this as a non-functional sinus surgery. Uh, you have to allow adequate sinus ventilation. So when you would obliterate a sinus, this would be also a non-functional sinus surgery. You have to facilitate mucociliary clearance and they have to be accessible for topical therapy. So these were the four main criteria where we got agreement on what is functional sinus surgery. 
But in the perspective of type 2 disease, which is, I think, more important is what is complete sinus surgery. And there was a little bit more debate on that. Um, but we really um, agreed on the fact that you should divide the nose in functional units, uh, like the frontal, the anterior, posterior, admit, sphenoid sinus, and the maxillary sinus. And you have to remove all the bony partitions within this functional unit or space. You have to incorporate the ostia in the surgical cavity. You have to remove the disease mucosa or the complete removal of inflamed of polypoid uh, tissue. So this means if you look on this sagittal view, that if you want to do a complete surgery, what we call in Belgium a fast three, four sinuses, where we want to have a neo sinus from the frontal to the sphenoid sinus, we have to remove all the bony partitions between frontal, anterior atomid, posterior atomid, and sphenoid sinus. And that you really get this neo sinus cavity. So you get this all connected sinuses in one cavity. Now, the reason or the rationale for that is that we want to deliver more topical therapy to the sinuses. So if you would use an intranasal corticosteroid spray, you would see, and if you look here, this is a video of my own nose uh, where I use a, um, a spray with mytilene blue. And you really see that um, my septum is, is sprayed, my inferior turbinate is sprayed, and the concentration of mytilene blue that will reach the, the head of the middle turbinate is quite low. And what we actually want is that your medication, your drug, gets more deeper into the nasal cavity, into the paranasal sinuses. Uh. So you really want to have this kind of state where you have a very good topical access of therapy. And there are some publications about that, and this is one from Richard Harvey's group, where they looked, um, I think this was on cadavers, where they looked at whether the type of surgery, the extent of the surgery versus the type of delivery will affect the local deposition of a, um, let's say, study drug. And what they saw is that when you do a spray with no surgery, there is very little medication that will enter into the sinuses. Eh? While when you go to a medial maxillectomy or to, a, let's say, a, a wide opening to the maxillary sinus and you use a netty pot or a squeeze bottle, you will have more access of uh, drugs into the sinuses. So what we really want to achieve is that we have a combination of a good surgical state, but also with a good topical delivery. And that's why we, we are quite in favor of using saline washes with budizonide or with momitazone combined with an extended surgery. Now, when we were talking about that here in our group, I had the question was, well, uh, we, we still know that it's, a, it's an immunological disease, it's an inflammatory disease, and we can have good access and with topical corticosteroids to, let's say, lower the inflammation, but can we also really have a disease modification with our surgery? And can we do a reboot of the immune system locally in the nose? Um, and um, there we came up with the idea about uh, rebooting um, the mucosa of the nose. So it means that we want to shift from doing polypectomies uh, and more to, in fact, doing an ileectomy or an il 5 ectomy uh, so that we really remove this local inflammation. And we, when we look back into the literature, there were already some indications uh, so uh, that we had to shift from isthmus surgery to more compartment surgery, and then at, at, at the end to, to radical surgery. And, and I think the reboot um, is really situated here in this more compartmental surgery. And the reboot was, was designed or invented by, by Klaus Wackert. Uh, um, and we, we still have a lot of discussion about this. Uh, so he, he made this graph with his green lines, with the mucosa that, that he removes. Um, but of course, I, I know from my practice that removing uh, every bit of mucosa in the alveolar recess or really in the lateral recess of the frontal sinus, I think it's quite uh, a task to remove this through a natural, let's say, middle metal antrostomy or with a draft 2A. Huh? Um, but of course, I think we have to, let's say, um, not focus really on this on the stripping of the mucosa, but really focusing 
on removal of the diseased mucosa and doing a complete surgery. So the areas that they keep untouched is, of course, the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate, the septum. And um, I will show you later, we could nicely show that from these areas, we will have a re-epitalization or re of uh, the sinuses with quite normal uh, mucosa. Now, in the beginning, we also um, included uh, in the reboot concept a draft tree. Uh, we, why? I, I, it's logic that when you do a draft tree, you will have better topical access, and you will also be able to remove the mucosa in a more uh, advanced way when doing draft tree. And here you see some examples, pre- and post-operative from a draft tree in a poly patient. And there is some evidence that um, a draft tree makes sense in patients with chronic sinusitis with polyps. Eh? Um, the group of formals show that you will have less recurrence, especially in the group with asthma and aspirin tolerance. Um, and also that the success rate when performed well is uh, acceptable for a draft tree in those kind of patients. Now, of course, when you want to do um, this kind of surgery, and I think, first of all, you have to be very experienced. Eh? So you have to be experienced. You have to know where you are. You have to also be able to deal with complications like CSF leaks. Um, and you have to have adequate or dedicated instruments. Eh? So what we use, especially in the maxillary sinus to remove polyps, is this Hoiweiser. This avoids to do a very big medial maxillectomy or a prelacrimal approach. So through the uh, middle male tenetrostomy, we are able to remove in the normal size maxillary sinus the majority of the polypoid disease. Now, of course, what are the results? Eh? So what we did was we uh, made a prospective study where we followed a group which had a reboot compared to a non-reboot group. And we could show and that's not a surprise that in both groups, we had a significant decrease in, in uh, sinus symptoms and nasal symptoms. But if we look at the SNOT22, we saw a significant, let's say, improvement um, in the SNOT22 score with the reboot compared to the non-reboot group. And important to know is that, let's say, the, the, the gain in SNOT22 symptoms of the reboot was more than 20 points. Eh? And this really equals um, the effect of a monoclonal uh, antibody. Uh, if you look at the, the, the Pilumop trials, uh, you see that they have a gain in SNOT22 of 18. Uh, so it's really, I think, something to consider that sinus surgery, it's not really out of date now uh, with, with the biologicals. Uh, you can really have nice uh, uh, improvements in sinonasal outcome uh, with a surgery. And if you looked at um, the moment when the polyps came back, and we had a follow-up here in this group of about uh, 30 to 40 months, um, we saw if we look at the non-reboot group, which is this blue line, and we compared it to the reboot without a draft tree or the reboot with a draft tree, you could clearly see that um, it takes more time to have a recurrence in the reboot group versus um, in the non-reboot group. And of course, there was some criticism, uh, whether you will remove a lot of mucosa from the nose, you will have scarring, you will have a non-functional cavity. But in fact, if you look at um, epithelial mucosal samples that we performed after the surgery, and here you see in histology uh, after nine months, you really see that you get a nice, again, pseudostratified uh, ciliary epithelium. Um, and if you look at the healing, you see that and this is a healing period within four weeks and that you really can go from a crusted uh, area and after one week of the surgery to a nice cavity four weeks after the surgery. And these are some examples from reboot uh, patients uh, that uh, after one year to two years, as you see here. So... Of course, we, we do our surgery not only to, to remove the inflammation and to, to uh, get rid of the polyps, but especially to uh, improve the smell of the patients. And also here we looked at a study um, in Reboot uh, where we looked at um, the uh, smell score. It was a subjective smell score. It was not an upset score. Um, where we actually saw if we compare Reboot versus more conventional endoscopic sinus surgery, um, that uh, we had an improvement of the smell up to nine months. And this was also the case in the endoscopic sinus surgery group. Uh, so it, it's not immediately that you have your 
improvement of smell. So it can take six to nine months to get this improvement. Um, but that especially in the reboot group, the smell um, stayed uh, stable uh, for this follow-up of uh, 24 months. Um, also, if you look whether again uh, you would add to the reboot a draft three or uh, do only a reboot without a draft three, you actually see not a big difference. Huh? So you see that um, the, the 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 smell is the same when you perform a draft three or no draft three. And also, if you look at the recurrence, and there we again compare the reboot uh, with uh, regular endoscopic sinus surgery. You see that if you look at the size of the polyps, if the polyp size is more than one or more than two, we have a significant uh, uh, less recurrences after two years. Of course, what we what we still lack is a, is a long-term follow-up study, and we are currently uh, performing uh, these kind of studies to have um, also the effect of reboot after four years and 10 years. But you see that this concept of doing um, more extended surgery and removing um, the inflammation of, of the nose completely is picked up also by other groups, as you see here, uh, by an Italian group. Uh, where they also looked at um, the mucosal samples, where you have here preoperatively a lot of eosinophilic inflammation, while here you see that uh, you get a nice epithelium with a nice basal membrane and, and stroma without a lot of inflammation. No. Of course, we were not the first inventors of this, let's say, more extended surgery for type 2 disease. Um, I think the, the credits go especially to the French group with Roger Jankowski, uh, where they also performed, in, in my opinion, um, a, a kind of reboot approach uh, by doing a complete surgery um, and also by resecting the middle term. It's something we don't do. Uh, and also there they could show that by doing a more complete surgery, they had less recurrences of nasal polyps compared to the classical endoscopic sinus surgery or atmoidectomy group. And another concept now which is arising is the mucoplasty from a Spanish group. Um, I think they perform, let's say, a reboot, but they add on top of this reboot a, um, let's say, mucoalization with a flap from the inferior meatus that they put into the atmoid cavity. And also with this technique, they are able to show that they have good outcomes and less recurrences compared to more conventional techniques. So at the end, I think if you talk about nasalization or you talk about reboot plus mucoplasty or you talk about reboot, I think we are a little bit talking about the same thing. I think the, the, the thing they have all in common is that you do a complete surgery. And if you, I'm not really, let's say, in favor of having a reboot or a radical as or a nasalization. Uh, so the thing you have to keep in mind when you do an endoscopic sinus surgery for a type 2 disease is that you remove the disease mucosa. So you really want to do an IL-5 ectomy. You want to create a single sinus cavity, in my opinion, uh, and you, have, you want to have good access for topical therapy. Uh, so it means that you do a complete sinus surgery for a severe inflammatory disease. And I think the group, which is really also in, in the same ID, uh, not doing reboot, but doing this complete endoscopic sinus surgery uh, combined with the corticosteroid irrigation, is the group of, of Warmold, uh, where they uh, had this publication, I think it's from this year, where they looked at 222 patients uh, who had type 2 disease, so who had eosinophilic chronic sinusitis with polyps, where they created this let's say, new sinus cavity, and also combined this with a very good topical therapy with local corticosteroids. And although it's only one year follow-up, and I think they will <clears throat> extend the study, but they really could have very nice results huh, with only in 7% polyp recurrence, um, only 3% needed oral corticosteroids therapies, very little patients needed a biological therapy, and also very little patients underwent a revision polypectomy. And I think we really have to focus on this concept, combining a good surgery with a good topical therapy and having long-term data about this type of surgery. So how to operate? I think we have to um, 
go into more complete sinus surgery. I think we have a lot of debate whether we should do a draft three or not, I think, in polyps. The older data show you have a benefit. The newer data show that this benefit is not really that big, in my opinion. And I think, especially when having biologicals available, I think the discussion of draft three in revision surgery becomes difficult to, to, to do. Now, as I said before, I think as important as a surgery is also, in my opinion, the postoperative care. And so we have a very intensive postoperative care in chronic sinusitis patients with polyps. It means that in the beginning, we give the patients topical therapy with lavages with mometazone or rebodizonide, and we also give them oral doxycycline. I will show you later on a study why. Um, and also, we continue this therapy, this topical therapy with budizonate and mometazone, in fact, life, not really lifelong, but on a very long term. And here you see these are, of course, anecdotal examples of a reboot patient on the left side who stopped his topical therapy. And you see that he has secretions here. And if you especially look into the draft three opening or to the frontal, you see a lot of uh, polyps coming, edema. And this is the same patient after starting again his topical therapy with a really nice healthy mucosa and the frontal sinus surgery. So it's not only the surgery, but it's also the continuation of the topical therapy. And why we give doxycycline? Well, we already did some research on doxycycline in nasal polyp disease. So let's really as a primary treatment where we could show that doxycycline is able to reduce the polyp size uh, modestly, but can really improve the, the symptoms of the patient. And we also wanted to test this postoperatively in our chronic sinusitis patients. And we designed a placebo controlled trial with doxycycline, um, and we included both polyp disease and non polyp disease. So it was an, old, an older study. Um, but what we could see if we combine the groups, we really don't see a big difference on the wound healing quality or on the wound healing score in chronic sinusitis patients with without polyps or in the combined group. But if you look at the wound healing score in the group of chronic sinusitis with, with nasal polyps, you clearly see a benefit in the patients who have doxycycline for six weeks, 100 milligram, that they have um, a quicker healing, a better healing, and they have less, less need of getting postoperative other antibiotics or oral corticosteroids. So doxycycline is really something we have incorporated in our postoperative uh, care. So where do we put this, this kind of, of surgery, this kind of extended endoscopic sinus surgery or reboot? I think um, I think it's already also included in the EPOS uh, guidelines. Uh, so it's really in type 2 disease. So in non-type 2 disease, we would be more conservative. So a mucosa sparing uh, endoscopic sinus surgery. But when you have this type 2 disease, we would go into a reboot surgery or an extended surgery uh, in the first place without a draft three. And of course, we still have to see how what will be the interplay with biologicals. Uh, shall we go to uh, the combination of biologicals with this kind of surgery to have really a disease modification? Do we pre-treat or post-treat our patients with biologics? Is this still something for a lot of research? So what is my or our philosophy here in Ghent for surgery for nasal polyp disease, well, it's an inflammatory disease. Eh? So you really have to think in, in terms of inflammation and not in terms of ventilation. Um, the control of the disease is not only surgical, but it's the combination of surgical and medical therapy. The surgery should be complete. So with removal of the disease mucosa, you have to aim for this widely open new sinus where you connect atmoid with sphenoid with frontal with maxillary sinuses and this will improve your outcome and facilitate local control and as i said before uh, the position of the biologicals first extensive surgery i think we will have a, a very nice debate in the next decade i think about this and there will be a lot of research going on where we would place the biologicals in terms of surgery so um, with this, I come to the end of, of my, my talk. And um, if you want to learn more about uh, sinus surgery, about reboot, but also about uh, the inflammatory pathophysiology behind this disease, uh, we have uh, an excellent FAST course, an international FAST course, which is uh, next year in August. 
uh, we will open the uh, the uh, let's say these inscriptions in the next uh, months. Uh, and we will have a, a very nice international faculty with Richard Harvey, Christos Kilgalas, Shaz Ahmed, uh, and uh, Manuel Benas Pekelsen, and of course our local faculty, Klaus Bakkerten and Philippe Gevaert. So, Puja, that's uh, the end of my talk. So, if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. We have been go, we've been uh, all through this panoramics. Uh, and a summary of a glance of the up, most up-to-date um, uh, findings as, you, as you've been um, dealing with reboot surgery. One of the concepts that is now uh, a lot of discussion, and we do have some questions right here. Uh, some of the others has been already uh, uh, replied by you, but uh, let's focus on, on what we do have by now. The first question is from Germany. Uh, what are your suggestions for the preparation of a patient that should be operated for chronic rhinocytes with nasal polyposis with an NPS score of 101? And what are the, uh, the, the preparation in cases of a, of a patient NPS 3-3? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I think if you if you look at the research, eh, what, what, the, what the evidence shows is that um, I think it's uh, the question is about giving oral corticosteroids preoperatively uh, or local corticosteroids. I think there is evidence for that. Eh? So um, it it will um, probably it won't affect the the outcome at the end of the surgery, but it will improve the easiness of the surgery. Eh? And that has been shown that uh, giving even with local corticosteroids, you reduce the inflammation um, and you will make your surgery easier. Eh? Um, I think it's very difficult to, to really show that this will uh, improve also the long-term outcome. If you ask me what you do locally in Ghent, of course, <laughs> we, we do a lot of research. So polyps are for us, uh, let's say, gold. Eh? So uh, we, we don't have the tendency to pre-medicate our patients with oral corticosteroids because then we remove the inflammation from the mucosa and we can't do any significant research on the mucosa. So actually, uh, we, we don't pre-treat our patients. Um, but of course, we ask our patients to stop to stop smoking, to consider not using uh, some uh, food um, supplements that affect the bleeding and things like that. But really, pre-medicating with with steroids, we don't do it. Huh? Another question. This is from Greece. Are you packing the nose post the functional endoscopic sinus surgery? And if so, how after how many days you remove these packs? Yeah, so I think we, we tend to pack less and less. Uh, when when I was in training, uh, we put uh, two small mirror cells and two big mirror cells in the nose. I think this is is changing. Um, if you have a let's say a, a mucosa sparing surgery for a non type two disease, I have the tendency not to pack anymore. But of course, if you do this uh, extended surgery, especially with the draft three, we um, still have the tendency to pack the nose. Um, so especially when we do a draft three, because we use some mucosal flaps also, we, we, we put in a celastic sheet, we put in some, some gel foam to keep the things in place. And then we put two small mirror cells in the atmoid cavity uh, and we remove them after day one or day two. So uh, it's really uh, you can question about the 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 if it will stop or prohibit the bleeding. But I think it's more uh, uh, a thing to reassure the nurses and the, the patients on the postoperative care um, than to to really have a really yeah. big tamponade of the nose. Another question is from France. The colleague is asking, what is your opinion or your practice for suturing the middle terminate to the nasal septum? Yeah, um, I think that's a good question. Um, so 
what we we tend to do is of course when you have this extend extensive polyp disease you can have a very floppy middle turbinate huh? uh, so the the turbinate can be very thin so if it's it's too thin and and too unstable we we remove the middle turbinate huh? but it's not something we routinely do so we really try to keep the middle turbinate um but when it has a tendency to 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 lateralize we use a varical suture when we go through and through the middle turbinate, the septum, and back. Uh, we don't do this bulgarization, but we just suture it with the with the varical suture. Uh, um, but it's it's of course something we decide uh, case by case and and not uh, not routinely. Yeah. Another question from Russia. The colleagues. Surgery, you saw the use of topic. Sorry, Puja, but there was some uh, bad connection. Hello. Hello? After you... how many uh, how many days after endoscopic sinus surgery you saw the use of topical steroid? Uh, uh, if they are packed when the packs are removed, and uh, when they are non packed, the day they go home, so the day after, yeah. So, and we we ask our patients to do uh, irrigation four times a day with a squeeze bottle. And of which two times there's uh, bidizonate or mimetazone added. And then uh, we see the patients every week in our hospital, the first month for uh, debridement and, and cleaning. Um, and then after uh, one month, we go back to twice daily um, uh, irrigations with bidizonite. And this is something we continue most of the time up to six months. And when we see that you have this very nice epithelium and very uh yeah if you don't see any inflammation we tend to taper down to once a day and even then to a few times a week uh, when the patient is well controlled and here's a question from the united states in regards to reboot surgery would you suggest the peeling of mucosa of the lamina papyracea yeah 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 so that's of course where you need some experience. Yeah? So the lamina papyrisa can is, is very thin, uh, but of course, and that's my experience with tumor surgery also that you really can have a nice plane, and by using very uh, delicate um, instruments, you really can peel it off from the atom, from the lamina papyrisa. Yeah. I, I think the danger points are really the skull base, yeah? so where you really want to remove the, the the mucosa over there. So there you have to let's say, make a balance between risk and, and really removing the last piece of, of disease, of course. Huh? Um, so that's why I'm not really, um, let's say, happy with this complete stripping of the mucosa is equal to reboot. Huh? So I think uh, removing as much as possible of the inflammation of the polyps and of the disease um, and doing a complete surgery, because that's what we often see um, is that uh, polyp patients have incomplete surgery. So they do a middle metal antrostomy, they open the anterior atomate partially, they remove the polyps in the superior meatus and also in the middle meatus, and then they stop. Eh? And that's, of course, not, let's say, giving a good access to topical therapy. Eh? So uh, I think the two concepts of reboot is, I think, a complete surgery and also remove as much of inflammation as possible. Well, I've noticed, I don't know if you notice this, if you have a case of a other patients that come to your attention after a few uh, days or and then two weeks after surgery, if you, you will notice that the, the surgeon did not open the whole cells and you will see all these uh, polyps that suddenly goes or pops out from the remaining cell mm -hmm. and invade and it looks like you never operated this mm -hmm. patient. So mm -hmm. that's the importance for me for opening, as you say, the whole mm -hmm. cavity mm -hmm. and have a nice and smooth cavity, which yeah. you can, of course, need the topical steroids to have it done. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have a, a personal, would you show your personal, well, email in case we do have other because we are running out of time we have a lots of other uh, questions so if you will be able to share I'll your uh, in the chat. email we'll, in the we'll chat. have uh, the, the, the remaining colleagues that will might ask you other questions in regards to this 
I put it in the chat. So I'm now typing typing it. Yes. So for anyone interested, is tibalt.vanzil at ugent.be. Uh, you can watch it this uh, um, meeting again. You can go through our uh, social media platforms and you can re-watch this. You can share it with your friends and colleagues. So don't, uh, if you need anything, you can directly ask about all this question. Thank you, Tibalt, for being with us today. Thank and you. I really hope we, we can have you for future communication too. One last thing. Uh, the next appointment is scheduled for November 24th, Thursday, 3 p.m. We have uh, a guest from Emory University, Nicole Schmidt, which uh, she's going to talk about operating on older patients with head and neck cancer, when, why, and how. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and I really hope to see you in the upcoming meetings. Don't forget, we will have Sophia, upcoming ERS meeting, everyone attending, juniors, of course. We will have travel grants and Nazosano grants. Thank you, Tibalt, for being with us and stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye.